John chapter 17, verses 5 through 8. And the King James text today reads, And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. If you'll bow your heads with me one more moment, Master, once again, Lord, we come before the throne of grace. The word of God must go forward. I need the anointing of the Holy Ghost if I'm to be any benefit or any help to the people of God. Master, in the name of Jesus, let the anointing of the Holy Ghost fall like rain at this hour. Touch my heart, touch my spirit, touch my mind and my lips that I might declare boldly from the Word of God that which you would have me to declare to the church of the living God at this moment in time, we need a word from the Lord. Lord, so many today preach pretty packaged sermons. They may sound good, but they're not the word of God. They may sound as though they come from Scripture, but they are not in fact and indeed a word from the Lord. I have no desire to stand in the sacred desk and deliver an empty message to your people. I want, oh God, to be your oracle. I want to be your voice, your mouthpiece, that you might deliver an edifying, uplifting, inspiring word to your people. Grant it at this hour. Touch every ear that hears. For we ask it in none other than Jesus' wonderful, precious name. I'm titling my message today, All the World's a Stage. All the World's a Stage. All the World's a Stage is the opening line from a monologue by the character Jacques in William Shakespeare's play, As You Like It. I want God's people to understand today that there is a purpose and there is a reason why it is that God chose to do things as he chose to do them. Most people who do not come from an apostolic oneness theological position have a very skewed, very wrong understanding of the doctrine of one God in Christ and Jesus is his name. If you do not have revelation and understanding concerning this doctrine, then I assure you 
uh, you have a very convoluted concept of what we teach and what we preach. I know this because I too was once one of you. And at one time in my life, in my simplistic and ignorant understanding of this doctrine, I used to look at oneness people and think, oh, those people, they're so goofy, they're so dumb. They take a passage here or a passage there out of context and, and they just don't get it. They just don't understand that God is three people. Well, the oneness position does not deny the existence of the Father. The oneness position does not de deny the position of the Son. The oneness position does not deny the Holy Ghost. The oneness position has a problem with the language of the Trinity which describes God as three distinct persons. First of all, how you can even begin to apply the term person to God is beyond me. God, the word of the Lord teaches us, is a spirit. The word of God declares the heavens are my throne and the earth is my footstool. If God is a person, then how big a person must he be? The Word of God also tells us whether you ascend to the highest heaven or whether you descend to the lowest hell, you cannot escape the presence of God. The Word of the Lord also declares that it is in Him that we live and we move and we have our being. God is. That is what the very name, the very title that is translated God, that's what that very word means. It means simply He is. He exists. He is there. He is not a person as we would define or understand a person. And trying to describe God in personage is insane at best. But this is the language that was embraced in the fourth century. And at the Nicene Council in 325 AD, the early church fathers who would become the foundation of the Roman Catholic Church decided that they would agree upon a statement in which they described God as eternally existing in three persons. Namely, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Well, I've got news for you, my friend. It is this doctrine and this doctrine alone which has excluded many, many, many Jews from converting to Christianity and believing on the Lord Jesus Christ because the doctrine of the Trinity does not even begin to mesh with Jewish theology, Jewish teaching, and Jewish understanding of God. It contradicts everything that the Word of the Lord says in the Old Testament. Last week I shared a number of passages with you from the prophet Isaiah in which God declares, I am the Lord, that is my name, and beside me there is no God. Elsewhere he said, and beside me there is no 
Father. And elsewhere he said, beside me there is no Savior. So don't tell me that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost are three separate people. Because if they are, God is a liar. He has declared through the prophet over and over again, I am alone. There is none else beside me. So if you're going to claim that these are persons, they have to be somewhere. If they're separate, distinct persons, they have to be somewhere. The Word of God describes in the Old Testament, one prophet said, I saw the Lord, and on his right and on his left side were all the hosts of heaven. He didn't say anything about seeing the eternal Son of God, but he said the host of angels were on his right and on his left. Where is that other person hiding I want to explain to you the position of the oneness of God, the apostolic position, is more than semantics. It is more than words. First of all, it relies upon Scripture for what terms we might use in describing God and the nature of God. We do not believe God is three people. We do, however, believe that God has distinctly, listen, manifested himself in three distinct ways. He is manifest as the Father in creation. He is manifest as the Son in Redemption, he is manifest as the Holy Ghost in regeneration. That simply means that one single God has occupied and occupies three different roles, three different manifestations. He presents himself in three distinct ways. But he is still one God, not persons, manifestations. The Lord Jesus Christ in our primary text today made a very powerful statement. He was praying for his disciples in John chapter 17. And in John 17, he said, And now, O Father, glorify thou me, listen, with thine own self. Wow, that's a pretty big ask. To ask God to glorify you with himself. Oh my goodness. Why didn't he ask to glorify God with himself. Oh my goodness. He said glorify thou me. My God have mercy. Whatsoever you do in word or in deed do it all. In the name of the Lord. Everything we do we're supposed to do for the glory of God. Am I telling the truth? That's how we're supposed to operate. Yet somehow Jesus felt comfortable in asking God the Father to glorify him, Jesus, with himself. God, you come wrap yourself around me and in so doing glorify me, my God. Heresy, lunacy, theological suicide. He then continues, not just glorify thou me with thine own self, but listen to the next portion. With the glory 
which I had with thee before the world was. The glory that you had with God before the world was. Isaiah 42 and 8. I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. My glory will I not give to another. Oh, Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory will I not give to Another. There is no way Jesus is a different person from God. He may be a different manifestation of God, but he is not a different person. Oh, hallelujah. In Isaiah 48 and 11, the Lord Jehovah declares, For mine own sake, even for mine own sake will I do it. For how should my name be polluted? And I will not give my glory unto another. God declares, <laughs> I do my own work. So that when credit is given, I have earned it and it is mine. Nobody takes credit. Nobody gets glorified. Nobody gets thanked. Nobody gets appreciated for anything that I say that I'm going to do because I alone will do it. Why? Because I will not have my name polluted. He said, you're not going to have somebody say, well, now look at God. Taking credit for something Jesus did. Look at the Father taking credit for something the Son did. He said, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> you're not going to pollute my name. What does he mean by that? He means you're not going to distort my reputation. You're not going to make me look bad by making it look like I'm taking credit for something that somebody else did. He said, oh, no, 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 no. But now let's go back to Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. I may just get happy today a little bit. Let's go back to Jesus praying for his disciples. Now you heard what the Lord just said. In Isaiah 48, 11, for mine own sake, even for mine own sake, I will do it. For how should my name be polluted? And I will not give my glory unto another. Now we got Jesus praying, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Now listen, verse number 6 John chapter 17, listen, I have manifested thy name unto the men. Woo. Which thou hast given me out of the world. 
Oh, I'll do it, God said, because you're not going to pollute my name. Now we got Jesus saying, glorify me. What? I have manifested thy name. What name have you demonstrated? What name have you laid bare? What name have you put forth before the world? I'll tell you the name. It's the name Yeshua. It is the name Joshua. It is the name Jesus. It means Jehovah is salvation. Jesus said, I have manifested thy name. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, my God, have mercy for mine own sake. Even for mine own sake. I will do it, Jehovah said. For how should my name be polluted and I will not give my glory unto another and the Lord said I have manifested thy name he didn't say I've told them your name I've shown them your name no no manifested thy name manifest is a word that from the Greek it is a verb that in the Greek is pronounced phanero. Uh, phanero. It means to make manifest or to make visible or to make known that which has been hidden or unknown. To manifest whether by words or deeds or in any other way. To make actual and visible to cause something to be realized to make known by teaching to become manifest be made known of a person it means to expose to view or make manifest to show oneself or to appear to become known to be plainly recognized, thoroughly understood who and what one is. <laughs> Jesus said, I have manifested thy name. When that term is used in relation to a person, it means to expose to view to make manifest, to show oneself, to appear, to become known, to be plainly recognized, thoroughly understood who and what one is. Oh, hallelujah. He said, I have made Jehovah as Savior visible. I have brought it out so that Jehovah's Savior could be clearly seen and recognized <laughs> so that he might become known. Oh, glory to the Lamb of God. Praise the name of Jesus. We believe that God is manifest as the Father he is manifest as the Son. He is manifest as the Holy Ghost. But as the Word of God declares, there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. Nowhere in Scripture do they try to explain how God is three. But they constantly explain how that the three are one. First Timothy 3.16 For and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. Manifest. Fanero, exposed to view, 
may manifest, show oneself, appear. God was manifest in the flesh. Hallelujah. Justified in the spirit. Meaning, in spirit, he was perfect without flaw. Seen of angels. Preached unto the Gentiles. Who was? God was. Believed on in the world. Who was? God was. Received up into glory. Who was? God was. Who do we know <laughs> fits the criteria of every description in this passage? Jesus. But Paul said it was God who was manifest. He said it was God who was justified in the spirit. It was God who was seen of angels. It was God who was preached unto the Gentiles. It was God who was believed on in the world. And it was God who was received up into glory. But Paul used the term manifest, phanero. He didn't use any term that suggested for a moment that Jesus Christ was a separate person from the Father. No. In John chapter 2, verses 9 through 11, we read of the miracle, the first miracle, public miracle, Jesus performed at the wedding in Cana of Galilee. Verses 9 through 11, John chapter 2. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom and saith unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, then that which is worse. But thou hast kept the good wine until now. Listen, verse 11. This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee. Oh, oh and manifested forth his glory hallelujah and manifested forth his glory hallelujah not the glory of god not the glory of the father not the glory of another but he manifested forth his glory my god people this isn't hard to understand. And it finishes saying, and his disciples believed on him. In 1 John 3, both verses 5 as well as verse 8. And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins and in him is no sin verse 8 he that committeth sin is of the devil for the devil sinneth from the beginning for this purpose the son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. See, we oneness folks are just dumb enough. Instead of taking a word like persons and trying to apply it to God, we let the scripture speak for us. And the scripture speaks of manifestation, 
manifest, manifested. Not persons. First Peter 1, 18 through 21. For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who by him do believe in God, that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God. Manifest. Why do we oneness use the term manifest? God is manifest as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. John chapter 1, beginning at verse 1, the word of the Lord reads, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without him was not anything made that was made. If you go down to verse 10 and 11, it says, He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. The word logos literally means a plan, an idea, something that is verbalized, something that is spoken. That is what word means. Word has nothing in the universe to do with a person. Nothing. This is saying that from the beginning God had a plan. In the beginning, God had a plan. And from the beginning, the plan was with God. In other words, he had it from the get-go. And the plan was God. Or the plan included God himself. Now, I want to help you understand the title of my message today. All the world is a stage. I'm going to help you understand the concept of God being manifest as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Not three people, but manifestations of one single glorious God. I want to paraphrase, if you'll give me a little attitude today, I want to paraphrase John chapter 1. And I want you to try to understand the parallel that I'm drawing. In the beginning was the play. And the play was with God from the beginning. And God starred in that play. All the stage was made by him, and without him was not any part of that stage made. He appeared before those who should have known him, and they did not appreciate his play. But as many, verse 12, as received him, 
To them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. I want you to understand today, Shakespeare said it right. All the world is a stage. God performed a one-man show. Salvation and redemption is a one-man show. Every character in God's plan, every character in the play, as it were, is played by God. You watch movies with Tyler Perry, and you see Tyler Perry appearing as himself. But then in a later scene, you see Tyler Perry appearing as Medea. And in another scene, even the same scene, you see him appearing as Medea's brother. Am I telling the truth now? Now you've got three different people appearing in the play, and yet every one of those people is Tyler Perry. He is playing every one of those roles. Now they have to film it in a certain sequence in order to put the pieces together in editing so it, it can appear as though they are all interacting one with another. That is simply because Tyler Perry is not God. God can play as many roles as God needs to play and never once does he have to be separate people to do it. To suggest that God has to be separate people in order to occupy three roles at one time is to not understand the nature of God. If God can hear the prayers of every believer on the planet, if he can devote his attention to each and every one of his sons and daughters simultaneously, why in the name of God are you so foolish as to think that God has to be three people? To occupy heaven as the Father, to occupy earth as the Son, and then to return to the earth after the ascension as the invisible presence and power of God. What makes you think God has to be three people to do that? Is your God so limited in abilities that he is incapable of manifesting himself in more than one place at one time? in more than one way at one time. I got news for you, children. My God is not so limited. Hallelujah. He is able to manifest himself as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost simultaneously and never stop for one minute simply being God. John chapter 14, verses 15 through 23. If ye love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. Listen, 
I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Doesn't sound like another person. It sounds like another manifestation is what it sounds like to me. Yet a little while and the world seeth me no more. But ye see me. Because I live, ye shall live also. Listen. At that day, ye shall know that I am in my Father and ye in me. Listen. That I am in my Father and ye in me. Doesn't sound like a separate person unless the Father's pregnant. At that day ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him, and will, oh my, manifest myself to him. Same word. Judas saith unto him, not Iscariot, Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world? Jesus answered and said unto him, if a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him, because the Son is in the Father. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. You can't have fellowship. You can't have communion with the Father except because of and through the man, Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 4, 5, and 6. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God, to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But he doesn't give his glory to any other. He doesn't share his glory. John chapter 10 verse 29. Jesus said, My Father which gave them me is greater than all. And no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. He says the Father is greater than all. But listen. In verse 28, John chapter 14, Jesus said, Ye have heard how I said unto you, I go away and come again unto you. If ye loved me, ye would rejoice, because I said, I go unto the Father, for my Father is greater than I. If there are three people, then the Trinity doctrine is a lie. Because the Trinity doctrine says they are three separate distinct persons, but they are equal. No, they're not. No. That man who walked planet Earth was gone. But as a man, he was limited. There were things he couldn't do. There were things he couldn't do. There were certain things that he was limited to by reason of his own choice. That's how he wrote the role. That's how he wrote the part. 
this character will only be able to do thus and so. He said, you should rejoice that I say I'm going to the Father because my Father is greater than I. He said, listen, listen. There's a reason why this drama is playing out on stage. There's a reason why you're seeing the characters that you're seeing and things are happening the way they're happening. Because if I came to earth and declared myself to be the Father, if I came to earth and declared myself to be God, and I did not wrap that understanding in a mystery if I did not wrap that understanding in revelation he said then what would happen is people would see God as a man and people would misunderstand people would get it twisted they would lose sight of the fact that God is a spirit. And that as a spirit, he is all-powerful. He is omnipresent. He is able to be everywhere at the same time. He said, see, there's a reason why I have to manifest myself in these various roles. There's a reason why I have to refer to my Father, which is in heaven, because that helps you to keep in your little squirrely human mind an understanding that God did not leave heaven to come down here. But that God can be in heaven and still be standing before you. Do you follow what I'm telling you? There's a reason why God wrote this play the way he wrote it. Because think about it for a moment. If he had done it differently, what kind of erroneous thinking? There are religious groups out there, folks, who have gotten into erroneous thinking, even with things having been done the way they've been done. Because people refuse to read the Word of God and let the Lord show them the truth and show them. He stands there and says, I will not leave you comfortless. I'm going to pray the Father send you another comforter. He said, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. So at the same time he's talking about another, he then turns around and says, I'm going to be the one who comes to you. He said, you know this spirit I'm talking about because this spirit has been with you, but he shall be in you. Oh, my goodness. Don't you get it? Don't you understand, folks? This isn't hard to grasp today. Philippians 6, 5 through 6, the word of the Lord declares, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, or one might say manifest as God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him, the form of a servant. That's the rule. And was made in the likeness of men. That's the role of the Savior. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. That's how he wrote the role. Are you following me today? Matthew 1, 20, 11, 27. All things are delivered unto me of my Father, and no man knoweth the Son but the Father. Neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son. And he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. 1 Corinthians 2, 6 through 8. How be it, 
We speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. You want to read some drama? You want to see a play? You want to see something played out? Read the book of Revelation. In the book of Revelation, things are played out in a series of uh, demonstrations that are representative in nature. You see figures, you see characters, you see things that are descriptive of or representing something. You're not seeing an actual such and so, but you're but that thing is representing something else. Therefore, the book of Revelation is, in effect, one big, enormous, divine drama. In Revelation 7, 17, For the Lamb, listen, which is in the midst of the throne, shall feed them, and shall lead them, unto living fountains of waters, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. The Lamb is in the midst of the throne. The word midst comes from the Greek word mesos, M-E-S-O-S. -E it is an adjective meaning in the middle of in the midst or amongst. So the Lamb is in the middle. He's in the midst. He's amongst the throne. <laughs> Revelation 22, verse 3. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. Not the thrones. There's not a throne for God and a throne for the Lamb. No, the one throne is the throne of both God and the Lamb. Well, why wouldn't it be? Because Jesus said, I am in my Father. He's the very heart of God. That character that God wrote for our redemption, for our salvation, that character was in God's heart before time began, before the world was created. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He had that character already designed. He had that character already written. That character has been in his heart. The Word of God tells us that Jesus Christ as the Son of God is in, is in, is in, not was in, not will be in, is in the bosom of the Father. He's part of God, honey. He's not another person. He's part of God. He is one of the many manifestations of God. Revelation 22 and 3, And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it. What's that now? Revelation 22 and 3. I think I gave the wrong reference. And there shall be no more curse but the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it and his servants and his servants and his servants. Whose servants? You just said the throne of God and of the Lamb. Who's his? The Lamb or God's? They're two separate people. Whose servants are they going to be? Said, and his servants shall serve him. 
singular, not plural. Matthew 19, 28, And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Matthew 25, 31 through 33, when the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory and before him shall be gathered all nations and he shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on the right hand, but the goats on the left. That's funny because in my Bible, God describes himself as the shepherd of Israel. Then Jesus came along and said, I am the good shepherd. When the rich man came to Jesus and said, Good master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus turned to him and said, Who are you calling good? There's not any good but God. And then he turns around later and says, I am the good shepherd. Oh, my Lord, have mercy. Folks, you take the word of God as a whole. Line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little, and it points you to one reality. God is not three people. He is one singular God, but he is one God who is able to play a multitude of roles on a stage and never be more than one singular God. Revelation 4 and 2, I'm almost done. And immediately John writes, I was in the Spirit. And behold, a throne was set in heaven. And one sat on the throne. Revelation 21 verses 5 through 7, And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Oh, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, made this declaration. I shall be his God, and he shall be my son. Who on earth are we talking about? Revelation 22, verses 12 through 13. Listen. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Now those of us who know the Word of God know that Jesus made this declaration many times. I'm the beginning and the end, the first and the last. But now listen, now he says, Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man a glory. Who's talking here? Jesus is talking, folks. How do I know? Matthew 16, 27, For the Son of Man shall come, in the glory of his Father. Remember, God doesn't give his glory to another. 
in the glory of his Father with his angels. And then he who, the Son of Man, shall reward every man according to his works. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Going back to Revelation 21 and verse 6, And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is the thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things. And I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Folks, I want to tell you today, as we watch the divine drama unfold before our eyes, we see from Scripture that the primary character in all of this play is the Lord God himself. It is he who plays every character. It is he who serves both as our advocate and our judge. It is he who stands as both God and the Lamb. It is he who wrote the play, and it is he who acted it out. Children, I want you to understand today, as Shakespeare penned the words, all the world's a stage. Hallelujah. Amen.